Good morning. Today I'm going to share with you some findings from the Mars landmark study that Premier Cook has just briefly described. Much work has already been done in this study and here I'd like to acknowledge the vital contribution of colleagues from Curtin University as well as support from an industry expert panel and an academic advisory group. In our first report, which was an analysis of publicly available documents, such as annual reports, we identified that mining companies listed on the AX200 tend to place more priority on physical health and safety of their workers, with less attention to mental health and well-being, and even less on the topic of respect. In our second report, which was a global a review of global research in mining, we found that mental health and well-being tends to be lower in this sector relative to other sectors, and indeed across the world, sexual harassment levels tend to be higher in mining than in other workplaces. And in our third uh, published report, uh, focusing here on mining in the state, we assess the views of human resources staff uh, work health and safety professionals and others, um, asking them about what are the key policies and practices that they have in place in their companies. There's quite some diversity in the sector. About one third of those surveyed reported that um, they strongly agree that their senior managers are committed to mental health and safety, uh, mental health and wellbeing of their workers. But there was about one third of those professionals reporting that that lack of commitment from senior management is, is not there. What I want to focus on today is the worker survey. So this is looking at the picture from the worker's perspective. And by workers, I mean anyone who works in the sector be that managers, engineers, operators, technicians, and I mean people on different contracts and different locations. The worker survey, as well as ongoing interviews and a benchmark survey that we're currently conducting of non-miners in similar jobs, together provide a baseline assessment, in essence a temperature check of workers' experiences right now. There will be a follow-up assessment in two years' time where we will evaluate how things have changed for whom and what is working. So turning now to the worker survey, 3,200 mining workers from Western Australia participated. As you can see, 35% were women, so we, we oversampled to get more women to do the survey. 63% were men. 22% come from frontline roles. 64% are working on mine site locations, and 87% are principal employees rather than contractors or, or labour hire. Importantly, altogether, uh, workers from 226 companies have participated in this survey. The worker survey has quite a few different elements, but today I'm going to focus on the R in the MARS acronym respect, specifically a lack of respect in the form of sexual harassment. There's going to be a full report covering all the aspects of Mars in October. So what I will do is unpack what is happening, so give a picture of the level of sexual harassment suggested in this very comprehensive sample, who is at most risk for these behaviours, are there particular situations where harassment is more likely? So where and when is harassment occurring? Why does it matter? Why do we care? And finally, what are some ideas for moving forward together? Sexual harassment is any form of sexually related behaviour that's unwelcome and that offends, humiliates or intimidates a person. What you can see here is an iceberg model that comes from global research on harassment. And this depicts that different forms of sexual harassment vary in their frequency. So at the tip of the iceberg are unwanted sexual attention 
and sexual coercion, which are those more overt forms of sexual harassment, and they're what we usually think of when we think of uh, sexual harassment. So unwanted sexual attention includes, for example, unwelcome or unreciprocated sexual behaviours, such as touching or cornering, uh, and, and it includes sexual assault. Sexual coercion is about the attempt to or actual extortion of sexual cooperation in return for job or career outcomes, um, such as the threat um, that an individual won't continue to be employed unless they have sex with the harasser. So in the worker survey, almost 10% of women and around 3% of men report experiencing unwanted sexual attention, sometimes, often, or very often, in the past 12 months whilst in a work setting. You can see that sexual coercion is less common with about 3% of women reporting frequent exposure to this behaviour and less than 1% of men. Underneath the iceberg are the much more frequent sexist and sexual hostility forms of behaviour which are more covert types of harassment. Sexual hostility is behaviours that insult people's abilities based on their gender and sexual hostility, sexual hostility is about those sexualised practices that are unwelcome and offensive. Here you can see from the worker survey, 36% of, of women sorry, and 9% of men report experiencing sexist hostility sometimes, often or very often in the past 12 months. So this suggests that more than a third of women are regularly experiencing gender-based, hostile and undermining comments about their abilities, such as comments that women are not suited for mining. About one quarter, or 23.5% of women, report sometimes often or very often experiencing sexual hostility, such as being subjected to pornographic pictures or questions about their sex lives or sex toys being put on their doors or other such offensive actions. 12% of men in the survey report frequent exposures to these behaviours. Our research further suggests that most of the time, whether you're a male or a female, the harassers are men, but which men engage in the harassment differs for male versus female victims. When men experience sexual harassment, it's mostly from their co-workers. But when women um, who, who are also frequently harassed by their co-workers at the same level, but in comparison to men, they're more likely to be harassed by senior co-workers, by clients and by managers. These high levels of harassment dovetail with a high level of bullying, which is defined as repeated and, um, and unreasonable behaviour that creates a risk to health and safety. As you can see, 23% of women and 11% of men reported being subject to bullying at least two to three times per month in the past six months at their workplaces. Witnessing bullying is even higher, as you can see from the figures. But on the positive side, these numbers are lower than what we reported in the 2018 FIFO study. The grey shading there shows that in this previous study, levels of bullying and witnessing bullying were higher than in the current worker survey. Now the samples are a little bit different, so we can't be definitive, but these findings suggest that there might already have been some improvement um, in the sector. Where does harassment occur and for whom? Um, turning first of all to the question of who is at risk, women, LGBTQIA plus individuals, workers of a younger age and those employed through a labour hire company are more likely to experience harassment. And these findings are very consistent with other research, including our global review 
of uh, mining across the world. What about where and when does this form of disrespect occur? And I'm going to focus here on the sexist and the sexual hostility as those were the most frequent forms of harassment experienced in the sample. So first of all, these harassing behaviours are more prevalent in workplaces where there is already poor work design and psychosocial risks and hazards. In other words, sexist and sexual hostility tends to go alongside a lack of opportunity for development, low role clarity, low job autonomy and excessive surveillance and rules, low support and high job insecurity. These forms of harassment are also more common for women when they're in the minor minority, that is working alongside all men or mostly men. And that again is a finding that dovetails with wider research um, showing that sexual harassment arises from gender inequality and disparity in power. Hostility is also more often experienced by frontline workers. Third, sexist and sexual hostility is also more likely when you have a leader or a boss who does not motivate, support and inspire you, which is what we call a lack of transformational leadership, or, unsurprisingly, when the manager, him or herself, is aggressive and abusive. Finally, these forms of harassment are more likely to be reported by workers who are in an unsupportive culture, and we've talked a lot about culture already today, such as a culture where people feel that the decisions that are made are unjust, that workers can't trust the grievance procedures, that people will be stigmatised if they raise concerns, and a sense that leaders do not care about uh, worker health and safety. In essence, this is that psychological safety that Holly uh, talked about earlier. So what these findings suggest is that these forms of sexual harassment co-occur with other risks to workers' mental health and well-being. They are part of an overall negative work environment. So turning now to why does it matter? Why do we care? Our statistical analyses show that those who experience sexual harassment also experience poorer mental health and well-being, and are more likely to quit. So if we look at the people who regularly experience sexist or sexual hostility, what the figure shows here is that 41% of those people are likely to be very dissatisfied with their work. And in fact, people in this group of um, regularly experiencing hostility are more than twice as likely than others to experience job satisfaction. What you can see here is that 73% of the people who are experiencing uh, frequent hostility report high burnout in their work. And people in this group experiencing hostility are over three times more likely than others to experience work burnout. 57% of those experiencing frequent hostility are likely to leave their current job. And again, people in this group experiencing hostility are more than four and a half times more likely to be planning to exit from their work. If we look at the workers who are experiencing high levels of unwanted sexual attention and coercion, those more overt forms of harassment, you can see they are also more likely to experience job dissatisfaction and burnout and be likely to leave. You can see, too, that the outcomes are slightly worse than for sexist and sexual hostility. But what is striking is that there is, there is not that much difference in impact. That is, the damaging psychological effect of sexist hostility and sexual hostility is almost as strong as the damaging impact of sexual coercion and unwanted sexual attention. Sexist and sexual hostility are sometimes considered a bit of harmless fun, just a joke. 
but these findings make clear that these behaviours are very harmful. So in light of these challenges, how can we move forward? The policy and practice survey that I referred to before, completed by human resource and related professionals, suggested that more than two thirds of companies are educating workers uh, about harassment and supports to at least a moderate degree. So that's terrific. And that actually aligns with the worker survey, which shows that um, about 67% of workers have engaged in this form of training. And of those, around about two thirds, or 62%, are finding the training to be at least moderately useful. And you can see similar findings for initiatives to increase awareness and celebrate diversity. So these findings show that action is already being undertaken. And as we've heard today, many stakeholders in the sector, unions, industry bodies, companies, the government, service providers are working really hard to improve the mining uh, workers' experiences. But it is clear from our research, as well as other sources of evidence that you'll hear more about today, that more needs to be done. It's important to improve formal reporting systems, and you've already heard that this morning, um, so that if people are experiencing these behaviours, they can report them. But formal reporting systems are no panacea. They are not enough in and of themselves, because workers often don't feel confident to use them, and they fear retaliation, and indeed retaliation is sadly too common. Also training and educating people about how to use these um, supports um, can be really helpful as the trainings that I, the findings that I've just reported show. But training only changes people's behaviour if it's really high quality training, not just a tick box sort of exercise. So arguably even more important than these sort of strategies about how to respond to harassment are strategies to prevent harassment. Um, and our research suggests the need to change the conditions in which harassment occurs. So we need to improve people's work design and develop a positive culture in which mental health and well-being has just as much attention as physical health and well-being. We need to address gender inequality in the sector by increasing the number of women especially in those senior leadership roles. We need to improve the everyday practices of managers and leaders. As one of the workers that we interviewed said, you know, it's still just production, production, and then that's where you start to see people's mental health impacted. We need to actively promote and hold people accountable for respect. For instance, not rewarding uh, and promoting bullies embedding respect into performance reviews and promotion processes, role modelling respect from the top. This morning I've shared some early findings from the worker survey with the full report available in October. So what we've shown is that although there are some positive initiatives already underway, there remains a high level of harassment and bullying that I believe we would all agree is too high, um, especially for some critical groups, and it is causing harm, significant harm, for worker mental health and well-being. Importantly, in two years' time, we're going to repeat the worker survey. So the challenge that I set for today is that there are more than 1,100 people present, and if every single one of us takes a small step to bring about change, we will see a more positive picture in 2025. And I will conclude with the words of one of the mining workers that we interviewed. Um, he or she said, look after your people's well-being, and they will look after the company. They will follow you to the ends of the earth if you need them to. Thank you very much.